So welcome everyone to the decarbonate launch of our work on whole life carbon in transport infrastructure. I'm Dr. Danielle Densley Tingley. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Civil and Structural Engineering at the University of Sheffield and one of the co-investigators on the decarbonate grant. So we're really excited to be able to launch our work um, and share with you what we've been up to this morning, looking at whole life carbon um, over road and rail. And this morning you'll hear from a couple of different speakers. So we've got first up uh, Professor Kevin Anderson, who's going to talk about the scale of the carbon emissions challenge, um, followed by Greg Marsden, who will talk about um, how, how and why really um, infrastructure carbon should be integrated into decision making. You'll then hear from Kadam Lakesh, um, who will give you a bit of an overview of the supporting technical work. Um, it's all the clever stuff um, behind the scenes looking at the whole life carbon. Um, Dr. Kadam Lakesh will talk you through. And then we'll have a short Q&A with the speakers. So if you want to pop um, questions in the chat as we go through, that would be great. And I can then pose them to our speakers. After um, that short Q&A, we've then got, um, we're inviting three more speakers on to have a panel discussion on um, what we've presented really means for decision makers. So how do we start to embed this into decision making? Um, what are the challenges, benefits, et cetera, with that? And again, for the panelists, um, I do invite you to pop your questions for them in the chat as well, and we can get through as much as we can in the time we've got. So we'll be wrapping up by 10.40, and this um, launch session will then be followed by a technical workshop, go into a bit more detail about what we can actually do um, in the next five to 10 years to bring down transport emissions um, in infrastructure. So hopefully you can stay on and join us for that as well. So with that very brief introduction from me, I'd like to um, introduce Professor Kevin Anderson from the University of Manchester in Uppsala, um, who's gonna to talk to you about the scale of the carbon emissions challenge. Over to you, Kevin. Unmute and hopefully, but just let me know if you can see the, hopefully see the slides. We've not got your full screen yet, Kevin. Yeah. There we go, perfect. Does that, does that come through? Okay, excellent. Yeah. Always that moment of um, worry when you first start these things. Um, so thank you very much. I've called this from iniquity to integrity, um, which is where we need to move to on climate change. But I think we're, we're currently still well embedded in iniquity. Um, there's no hiding place for carbon budgets is the um, sort of uh, tagline to this. So I'm going to start off with something we're all familiar with, the Paris Agreement, and to aim to stay well below two. But actually, um, I'm going to tighten that to say we've now got a lot more emphasis on 1.5, and we need to think about what that might mean. Uh, and it's strengthened first after Paris by the big report from the IPCC, SR 1.45, special report 1.5, where it focused on the impacts of 1.5 degrees centigrade and compared those with two to give us a better handle on, on uh, what we're facing. And I'm going to summarize all of that report with this with a couple of lines. The impacts of even 1.5 degrees centigrade are severe across ecosystems, human systems, physical infrastructure, and agriculture. More floods, more droughts, more extinctions, more human migration. They're much worse at two degrees centigrade, but let's not pretend that one is in any way a safe threshold. Um, it's incredibly dangerous with severe impacts. Um, and it was really a prelude, I think, that they, the SR 1.5 to a whole series of climate emergencies. Here's the ones from the UK and the, its various devolved administrations, but you can see this in many other parts of the world and companies as well and institutions declaring climate emergencies. And then building on that, we had the G7 agreement and the communique in May of last year, um, where it reiterated again the importance of 1.5, and that fed into the COP26 with a strap line of keep 1.5 alive. And here we have Patrick Valance, the UK government's chief scientific um, advisor, making the comment that it is not a negotiable thing. And I think if you're for the many poor parts of the world who are suffering the impacts of the climate change we've imposed upon them, that's exactly how they would see this. It's not negotiable. And I think that needs to be key when we think about embedded emissions, infrastructure, and so forth. But let's also be clear at one degree centigrade of warming, 1.1 that we're at today, that we're at today. Many people in Bangladesh, Mozambique, Madagascar, and many other parts of the world, and increasingly wealthy parts of the world, are already feeling the impacts of climate change. Many people are already suffering it today. It's, it's having impacts on our ecosystems, some really severe impacts on, for instance, tropical coals, which will be virtually no tropical coals around the planet at two degrees centigrade. And even at one and a half, we're going to probably lose three quarters of them. So it's a very severe impact on ecosystems and obviously locking in significant climate change for future generations. But let's also be clear 
that climate change is not a threat, it's a reality. Many, many people, many millions of people are suffering and dying from the climate change that we have imposed on them that is coming across in terms of um, exacerbated extreme weather conditions. Um, I want to now go from our commitments to the science. And I'm going to use this, it's not meant to be flippant this. Uh, the climate does not respond to good intentions, to Machiavellian policies, eloquent arguments, legacy, legal niceties or accountancy scams. And thus far for the last 30 years, these are the things that we've practiced. All of these are trumped by the brutal beauty of the physics. The only thing that matters in terms of temperature is the total amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that we dump in the atmosphere. Yeah, we can scan behind it all we want to with the candidacy, but it won't, you know, it won't change the physics. So what does the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, tell us about the Paris Agreement? Well, I'm going to just see, just take out the, the, the headline global carbon budgets. Um, for firstly, for a 50% chance of 1.5, so a 50-50 chance. Then we have about 420 billion tonnes of CO2 um, from 2022 that we can dump in the atmosphere to give us that sort of probability. If we go for um, something that's, that's less onerous, um, and they, what they call in the IPCC an 83% chance of two degrees centigrade, well below two degrees if you like, then we have 820 billion tonnes. But we also get, of course, far more severe impacts and higher risks of non linearities um, in the system. So tipping points, some people call them. And just to give a flavor of that, 50% of 1.5 degrees centigrade, that's 10 years of current emissions. We currently emit about 42 billion tons a year, of which about 36 and a half is from energy. And even for the um, two degree centigrade one with much higher impacts, it's only 19 years. Plot those out and you realize there's very little chance scope for actually moving those curves. This is the 1.7 degrees curve. And look how tight the 1.5 degree C curve is, the one we've actually, we've actually bought into this one. We say we're going to deliver on that curve at a global, that's, remember that's at a global level. There's very little flexibility in that curve to move it around. But we also agreed to make our cuts on the basis of equity. Um, and that means the wealthy countries have to lead in, in, in making the, the shift away from fossil fuels in particular. So if we then look at developed and developing countries and think about a 50, 50 uh, chance of 1.5, you see curves like this. Now, it looks here that we've been very generous to the developing countries. If you look at the cumulative emissions per person, it's still being dis unfair on the, poor, on the richer parts of the world. 83% of the population live in, that, in the orange curve and 17% in the blue curve. But look at, the, look at the zero emissions date, 2031 for 1.5. This is just maths, arithmetic, and the IPCC budgets. If, you, if you're happy to go with two degrees centigrade, I don't, don't think poor people elsewhere in the world will be, but um, if we're happy, to, then it gives us till perhaps 2037 at a, uh, between those two. So if we played that out for the UK, if we want an 83% chance, we've, we've done some sort of detailed work behind this. The UK is roughly the average actually for developed countries. We have a carbon budget of about three and a half billion tonnes, which is actually only just over half what the CCC imply in their, in their um, pathways. That's about nine years of current UK emissions, including aviation and shipping, but it's, this is territorial, not consumption based. That's over 10% per annum reduction in emissions and zero emission date by 2037, um, if you follow the, broadly a straight line with a, with a logic adjustment to it. If you went for the 1.5 that we're actually committed to now, um, then your, your carbon budget is reduced significantly, 1.7 billion tonnes, uh, about four years of current UK emissions and emission reduction rates about 19% per year. This may sound unrealistic, but this is what comes out of 30 years of doing virtually nothing on climate change and a zero emissions date by 2031. So we need to treat climate change like the emergency it is, like we did the COVID or like we did the banking crisis. For the UK to meet its 1.5 degrees, its 1.5 degrees C commitment, we need something like 19% per annum mitigation, zero emissions by about 2031. That's transport, industry, heating, electricity, infrastructure, everything. There are no exempt sectors. There are no expedient boundaries. Every ton of CO2 counts. No scams, no hiding just physics. Um, so hopefully that's in my five minutes. Almost, Kevin. Thank you. That's fantastic. Um, and over to Professor Greg Marston next, please. Just waiting for the slides to go. There we are. 
Um, okay, hopefully you've got them. Uh, now, thanks, Kevin. So I'm going to take you through some of the policy implications of our report before I hand over to uh, Kadam, who who did uh, most of the hard yards with with Danny on on this uh, on the technical report. I'm going to begin by saying that we, in writing the report, we've tried to be infrastructure agnostic. There are lots of reasons that we might need uh, infrastructure, lots of demands for new infrastructure, not least I would suggest with respect to uh, adaptation, if you follow the latest IPCC AR6 report, but also a lot of the investments that we need to make uh, in order to deliver um, a, a zero carbon um, energy system, for example. However, the question we set out to answer was, what role does and should the carbon impacts of infrastructure play in our decision-making processes? incredible really that 14 years after the first climate change act that we were having to ask that particular question so um to accountancy uh which kevin pointed to who is responsible for the carbon from construction well i'll, I'll start with the uh, official answer which is pretty simple um if we take um england department for transport is allocated responsibility for the emissions of the vehicles which move by land sea uh, and air uh, department for business energy and industrial strategy are responsible for industrial emissions which would include iron and steel cement and concrete if it was produced in the uk international emissions count where they're produced so they wouldn't be uh, part of that uh, particular accounting but then if we think about the promotion of new infrastructure, this comes from, uh, again, in England, Department for Transport or local authorities. Uh, I've also included um, Department for Leveling Up um, because of new homes and all the roads that are associated with that. So the majority of the emissions associated with infrastructure, construction and maintenance don't belong to the department that's responsible for sponsoring the creation of those emissions. So it isn't currently possible to trace across the infrastructure plans from the transport sector to the total emissions, for example, in the CCC's analysis of industrial emissions, in essence, everyone's responsible for the emissions, except that no one is responsible for the emissions. So why does that matter? Well, Kevin's painted the picture on the overall position with respect to 1.5C, but just keeping this to transport, we're failing. So we're not on track with our required pathways. I look back at what was said in the 2010 fourth carbon budget. Transport could achieve a 26% reduction in emissions between 2010 and 2022, sorry, in 2020, and it managed just a 4.2% reduction. Underwhelming, probably disastrous. We've got a national strategy now across uh, the different administrations and some really positive developments, but let's be clear, our strategies are not even close to putting us on track. Chart on the right comes from a bold transport strategy from Leeds City Council. The mode shift targets you can see in the top right corner, so a doubling of rail, more than a doubling of bus use, a 30% reduction in car trips. I mean, wow, we have never done anything like this ever uh, anywhere in the UK. Um, that would produce the blue line which gives us just a 43% reduction in emissions by 2030 out of their 100% uh, goal. Uh, but just important to note here is that the blue line is unfunded and it would require more money per year than Leeds has ever received in the past. So it would require a huge step change and that would have to happen across the country. So we are in deep trouble. Some people argue that the carbon from um, new infrastructure is small, but we are overdrawn on our carbon budgets. We have no means of repaying the current debt. So we have to think supremely hard about adding to any of that. Most of the schemes in the system today were on the books a decade ago. Have we really done the soul searching that we need to, to address this? So a couple of slides just briefly on the headline findings for road and rail. This chart shows where in the process of construction uh, and management of uh, road assets, the embodied carbon comes from. And this is for a dual three lane, uh, two lane and single lane, um, single two lane roads, just for a kilometer of, uh, of road. Cadden will talk through how she got to these assumptions uh, and so on. But important for roads is material production and transport is around 80% of the emissions. So those emissions happen early in the process 
And so most of the embodied emissions are dependent on the technologies that are approved for use at the point of construction. We've looked at various technologies which could be used to reduce the emissions of the construction process, and there still remains a sizable chunk, even by the 2040s, that is hard to decarbonize. And that's if industry can take on all of these different innovations, they're still at a fairly early stage at the moment. The picture's slightly different uh, on rail to road. Here, the two main options are a ballasted track and ballastless track and the approach taken makes a difference. Um, the materials emissions are, are lower upfront when you're using ballast track, because when it's ballastless, you're, you're essentially using concrete. And so that's got higher emissions. However, that flips when you look at maintenance across the whole uh, 60 year period. Point being that how we build, as well as how much we build, will feed into the impacts on the budget constraint. Again, looking at innovations that we have in the road, uh, as we have in the road sector, but taking account of different characteristics of rail, we still find uh, a, a significant bulk, which is very difficult to, um, to remove. So what? So the Secretary of State argued that the, um, for, for, for UK argued that CO2 emissions from our roads investment strategy uh, should be ignored because they were so small relative to the rest of our transport missions as to not be material in his decision to approve the programme. This is, of course, simply a construct to get around the fact that CO2 emissions were not a constraint on the development of that roads programme. But how much do they matter? Well, we've made an assessment of the total carbon consequences of building a range of schemes, which you can see in the technical reports. Some of them are uh, artificial schemes, some are representative of early stage outlined schemes in, in the Transport for the North forward programme. Here we present just a slide for one kilometre of dual two lane road. What we've done is assume that the carbon in the construction needs to be paid back either within 10 or 20 years and the equal amounts are going to be paid back every year over that period. We then work out how many car kilometres that is equivalent to and would need to be removed if the scheme was going to just be carbon neutral, not carbon beneficial. As you'll see, as car efficiency improves, then the amount of car kilometres that you need to remove every year from the road to pay back the carbon from the infrastructure grows. The figures for one kilometre of dual two lane road built today a 1.42 million car kilometres in 2020, 2.27 car kilometres in 2030, if you take a, a 10 year payback period. To put that in context, a million car kilometres is equivalent to over 1,700 fewer people commuting by car for a whole year. And don't forget, that would be on top of the 30% reduction in car trips or, what, or, or whatever level of reduction in car trips we're already committing to. You know, so these are, these are huge additional asks on top of what's already an undeliverable promise. So we come to the conclusion, road schemes will never pay back their carbon in transport terms. They're also encouraging more people to drive. Rail schemes have a very similar shape chart to the one that's shown here. But if rail schemes can deliver mode shift, then they can pay back their emissions in terms of what they deliver. But it's important to look at each scheme and it's important to think about change over time. So very briefly, when we look ahead, infrastructure schemes take a long time to bring through the decision making process. As we move into the 2030s, the impacts of electrifying uh, the car fleet on carbon emissions are quite significant to the, the, like the emissions from in use driving. So beyond 2035, it's difficult to see carbon from movement being the dominant factor in infrastructure decisions, if we're on plan, and that's a big if. There are also assumptions about changes to industrial processes, which suggest steep falls in cement and iron and steel emissions by the late 2030s, although some of this is tied up in technologies such as uh, carbon capture and storage and BECs, which are not yet available at scale. So there's a lot of promise about what might be possible later in the 2030s. But what this says to me is that we need to find a way to go on a diet. We have to manage down our infrastructure requirements whilst the low carbon technologies are being developed and proven. And that anything built between now and 2035 has got to be under incredibly heavy scrutiny. So to conclude then, 
The divide in responsibility between the Department for Transport and Bays is meaning that essentially the kids are spending from the adults bank account with impunity. It would make more sense if the transport infrastructure carbon budget was clearly established and that the Department for Transport was assigned responsibility for that and I'm looking forward to hearing about the approach in Wales which is being taken to integrate this thinking. At the moment it's difficult to see uh, the approach to infrastructure planning doing anything other than adding to the carbon gap. It's difficult to see how we can justify in carbon terms the plans for infrastructure we had before we recognise the carbon constraint. We've also had the pandemic we're faced with rising oil prices. We can travel less by car. In fact, we must travel less by car if we're to reach our goals. Scotland has already committed to a 20% cut in car kilometres by 2030, and I have not seen any analysis from anywhere else that doesn't suggest we need to reduce the distances that we travel. We also need to factor in planning for infrastructure to cope with our climate adaptation needs and to build all of the infrastructure necessary to enable zero carbon vehicles, for example. We cannot take for granted that embodied emissions uh, from, mater uh, from material innovation just happens. And for those staying for the technical workshop, this is gonna be discussed further. My final point is that we still have a number of organizations trying to justify previous plans they had in carbon terms. We should instead be turning the question on its head and asking what infrastructure do we actually need for a zero carbon society in 2045, I think the answers will be very different. I think they have to be very different. Okay, thanks. So with that, I'll stop and hand over to Kadam. I hope you are able to see my screen okay or not. It's not come through yet, Kadam. There we go, it's starting to come through now. Hello. Thanks, Danny. Um, and so. thanks, Greg, for the granular insight and clarity on, on carbon jurisdiction responsibilities and the needed action. Uh, so good morning, everyone. I'm Karim Lokesh. I'm uh, an ex-decarbonate researcher, but now a uh, senior transport LCA expert from Ricardo Energy and Environment. Such a pleasure to be a part of Leeds, uh, even for a brief period. Uh, so for now, I'll be delving into the technical details, uh, which form the basis of the policy analysis that is being launched today. But before anything, I'd like to thank our colleagues from Decarbonate for organizing this launch and from TFN and Network Rail for the support and cooperation and prompt responses. Uh, so this work is about understanding the prevalence of embodied carbon in the existing and planned transport infrastructure. Um, added to that, we are also trying to gauge the scale of burden that we are adding to ourselves in our race to net zero. So in this study, we uh, did some carbon assessment of some basic infrastructure components of road and rail, applying two sets of sensitivity studies. So one focusing on the integration of low carbon alternative construction materials, and the other one focusing on the integration of a steadily decarbonizing energy grid. But the decarbonizing energy grid assessment is applied only for energy demand for asset operation and not across the whole life. Setting the scene for uh, road infrastructure now. So we had a set of case studies to assess the carbon performance for, and for that we needed some basic high level carbon figures. Uh, so um, we did the same for roads, but we also looked at other affiliated structures like road lighting, uh, sort of traffic signal systems, junctions and slip roads. But in the interest of time, I'll be focusing only on the key infrastructure here, basically the roads. However, please feel free to have a look at the technical report for more sort of granular analysis into the other components. The goal of the study was to get a basic carbon estimate for one kilometer of road. So the first step was to develop a bill of materials and device methodology that will help assess the carbon performance of one kilometer of road over an assumed service life of about 40 years. 
So we looked at roads of varying scales. Um, as you can see here, the single two lane, dual two lane and dual three lane carriageway as, as presented in the images. Uh, but despite this difference in scale, the pavement structure was assumed to remain the same. And these dimensions were adopted from National Highways Design Guide. So we chose to adopt the principles of life cycle assessment uh, to determine the embodied uh, and operational carbon of these assets over the assumed service period. Uh, for this work, we use the National Highways uh, Carbon Calculator to get a basic estimate of the impacts of construction and independently modeled the operational emissions uh, using our own spreadsheet based uh, models. Next, we needed to define the system boundary for our study. So we are accounting for all the carbon emissions from the material sourced for the construction of that one kilometer of road, right up to its operation and maintenance over the next 40 year period. So the various key subsystems um, and the relevant processes included within our analysis are presented within the dotted lines. Uh, but please note that, uh, particularly for operation, we are only considering the uh, emissions from the energy demand for operating road lighting and not vehicular emissions. So diving straight into the outcomes of, of our carbon analysis, we found that the construction of the, very, of the roads of various scales carried a whole life carbon of anywhere between 900 to 2600 tons of CO2 equivalent. Uh, so to put this in context, this is equivalent to commute emissions from, uh, you know, a, an average car that has traveled about four to 11 million vehicle miles in a year. So the highest carbon contributor here were, of course, the materials that were used in the construction of these roads, particularly asphalt and concrete. And these emissions were so high that they make up about 70% of the whole life carbon of the asset over that period. So the material production was closely followed by the carbon intensity of the energy needed to have these road, roads well lit. Uh, but we understand that there are stretches of road that don't necessarily need any road lighting, in which case uh, transport of these materials from the sourcing location to the construction site and the emissions coming from those fuel consumption uh, become the second highest contributor. So now that we have these outline figures for each of the life cycle stages, we wanted to assess their impact when the use of low carbon and you know, kind of secondary materials, recycled materials were integrated into the construction process. So we looked at bio-based uh, alternatives for the conventional asphalt binders. We looked at mixes of uh, crushed concrete and construction rejects. And um, we also looked at recycled asphalt pavement uh, as a replacement for sort of fine aggregates needed for the surface course. I mean, you may notice that this, is, this may not be the most exhaustive list of low carbon materials to look at, but this is a field that is rapidly evolving and we couldn't necessarily capture all of them, but this is a start and there is scope for sort of expanding uh, this particular area within this analysis. But the caveat here is that commercial nature for some of these scenarios are unknown at this point. However, each of these scenarios are either being piloted or planned for trial in some part of the road network. So various resource efficiency scenarios delivered varying levels of carbon savings uh, compared to the baseline case study where we are considering the conventional mode of construction using you know, virgin material. But the the scenario that delivered the highest amount of savings of about 11% uh, compared to baseline was when crushed concrete and construction rejects were included into the subgrade and the sub-base layer. In summary, the alternative material use, the secondary material use, delivered savings in the range of about 5 to 12%. So that was the maximum savings that we could observe on a whole life basis. For the second round of sensitivity study, we uh, chose to use two out of the four decarbonization pathways that the national grid had modeled uh, for themselves and for the industries using their energy. Firstly, we have the steady progression pathway, which represents a situation where take up take on the supply side and behavioral changes on, on demand side, on our side, is kind of happening at a rate as we have seen today. And then we have the system transformation pathway where there is rapid uh, tech improvements happening on the supply side. 
But uh, on the demand side, in terms of behavioral and societal changes, we are still in line with that of the baseline levels. But the main difference between the two scenarios is the use of fossil fuels. For the first one, our fossil fuel use in the energy mix actually continues even beyond 2050. As for system transformation, we are weaning off of any fossil material use uh, from 2038 onwards. So we do reach carbon neutrality by 2030. And then there is some level of CCS that has been modeled into this energy uh, modeling. So we are getting access to some level of you know, carbon negative uh, sort of energy supply at this point. So when applying all that modeling to the whole life carbon that uh, we had estimated for, for our roads, uh, we are able to see a maximum, uh, an absolute maximum of carbon savings of about 18%. Uh, in 2060. So this is where we are integrating the um, carbon intensity for the energy supply to our road lighting over a period of 2020 to 2060. Now, if we look at the same modeling, uh, applying the system transformation pathway, we are able to extend these savings to about 40%. The takeaway message here is that the embodied emissions are so large in proportion and so stubborn that even negative carbon contributions from a decarbonizing grid does not alleviate this, this whole life carbon of that asset in question. So every new construction leaves a challenging remainder of at least 60 to 80% of whole life carbon for us to neutralize elsewhere. So moving on to real side of things, here again, we want to get a basic preliminary carbon estimate of some key rail site components uh, over a service life, however, of 60 years at this time. However, similar to road side of things, the carbon impacts are presented only for one kilometer of a single ballasted track and uh, appropriate overhead line equipment. So imagine an electrified rail line. So for more granular analysis on this and the other components uh, which are included in this table, as you can, you can always refer to the technical report. But uh, we again decided to go by the principles of life cycle assessment to measure the whole life carbon for which we utilize the RSSB rail carbon tool. So the construction and the use of one kilometer of ballasted track creates roughly about 2000 tons of CO2 equivalent. Installing an OLE produces an additional 1700 tons of CO2 equivalent. But you may notice that it is the maintenance phase that is the most carbon intense across the entire life cycle of the built asset. Again, this is because of the frequency and the need for material replenishment on a regular basis, particularly sleepers, the ballasts, and sometimes the rail, steel rails themselves. However, to be absolutely conclusive about things, it would be useful to explore what the material circularity practices uh, are that the network rail or any other uh, sort of rail infrastructure uh, authority um, employs. So higher levels of material reuse is capable of bringing down these material uh, emissions that we see on the maintenance phase. So we applied our alternative uh, material uh, sensitivity study to the sleepers in this rail segment. We looked at some synthetic wooden sleepers, uh, which are otherwise called fiber formed um, fiber foam urethane sleepers. I'll, I'll spare you from those technical details. And then the second one we looked at were the recycled composite sleepers that are made of concrete, uh, recycled plastic and powdered tire rubber. So there's a lot of secondary material going into this particular case study. The idea is basically to protect these sleepers from the abrasive damage of the underlying ballast. So here are the outcomes for what we've seen so far. In summary, we found that the recycled composite sleepers delivered more carbon savings compared to the other uh, sleeper alternatives that we have looked at. Kadam, sorry, can you just start to wrap up now, please? Yes, absolutely. Uh, this would be the next slide. When applying the uh, decarbonizing energy supply to our rail site demand uh, between 2020 and 2060, we see uh, some level of carbon savings, again, we are able to see 22% of savings under the steady progression scenario compared to our 2020 levels. When applying the system transformation pathway, we are able to see a savings of up to 64%. So quickly uh, sort of wrapping up, uh, you know, some of the key messages from this technical analysis. The main source of carbon intensity for roads lie in the material procurement side, 
As for the rail, it lies in the maintenance phase. With the integration of low carbon construction materials, the maximum savings that we are able to see on both sides falls in the range of about 12 to 15%. Um, when we factor in the impacts of a steadily decarbonizing energy grid, the net emissions are still high that we end up with a balance of about 18 to 60%, which remains a challenging fraction of whole life carbon to alleviate. Now, when applying these findings to the case studies and also adopting appropriate carbon payback scenarios, we observed um, that the payback was basically driven by specific factors particularly uh, for rail, it was the scale of construction and the purpose of intervention. Whereas for roads, we found no scope for a carbon business case whatsoever. So ultimately the bottom line from our study is that if we are to take net zero seriously, build only if you absolutely critically uh, need it as it is hard to neutralize any new additions from this point onwards. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Kadam. Um, and thank you to all our speakers. We've just got a couple of minutes for questions. We're running a little bit behind. Um, so I'll pose a couple, and then if I can ask our speakers perhaps just to go through the chat um, and try and answer a few in the chat, that would be great. So just to collate a couple together, there's a few on the sort of broader scope of work that we covered, um, whether we looked at tunnels, viaducts, um, and those sorts of things. Kadam, I wonder if you could just very briefly comment on is in the wider technical report. Apologies, I missed that question. Could you repeat that? Sorry, Danny. Yeah, so there's a few questions around um, the different areas that we covered in the reports, whether things like bridges, viaducts, um, junctions for roads were covered. I wonder if you could just very briefly summarise what's in the technical report so people um, yes. know what to go have a look at. Absolutely. So picking on the elements that you have highlighted, yes, we have looked at viaducts, uh, bridges, um, and we have also looked at uh, junctions and slip roads as a part of the road uh, side of the technical report. Uh, within uh, rail side technical report, we have looked at uh, bridges, um, sort of electrified train tracks, um, sort of installation of auto transformers, um, things, things, things like that. Great, thank you. Um, so I just encourage you to go have a look really if you're interested Absolutely. in those areas of the technical report. Um, and then you can have a look at some of the detail there. Um, so there's a really nice question here, which I think probably Kevin and Greg will have views on. Um, so it says not all areas currently have the same quality of road infrastructure. And of course, we could look at that um, nationally or indeed globally. Are we saying you shouldn't be building new roads and this imbalance should continue? Kevin, I don't know if you want to comment. Oh, sorry, Greg, you've unmuted, you go. Yeah, I think the um, so within the budgets that Kevin set out at the moment, we already you know do consume or uh, produce carbon through the construction that we make. So one of the things that we need to be really clear about is how much of our carbon budget are we giving over to to infrastructure, and at the moment we're not being clear about that, and so everyone's allowing themselves to be that bit of infrastructure that doesn't really matter. Okay, so what we I'm I'm not saying that there should be no new infrastructure. I think that's an unreasonable position to be in. But what I am saying is that we need to be absolutely clear what the constraints are around how much new infrastructure we can afford. And if we want more of that, then we have to be more ambitious somewhere else. And at the moment, I simply don't see that there's scope for us to be more ambitious somewhere else. In fact, we've got gaps in the other part of our policy programme. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. Um, yeah, I think I'd probably... Callum, and in fact you, Danny, and, and Greg know this area much better than me, but I think I'd go as far as saying there should be no new road infrastructure. I think given where we are on our, in our carbon budgets, there's an opportunity cost here. Any carbon coming out of the road infrastructure is carbon that we can't, you cannot use in some other port form of, um, of transport infrastructure. Um, and so what, as you say, there's a huge imbalance in inequality and access to, to roads, and that needs to be balanced not by new roads, but by alternative transport infrastructures for those parts that, that, that are already suffering from that sort of inequity in the system, if you like. Locking in more roads locks in the wrong form of transport, even if it's electrical transport. The idea of 2,000 kilograms of metal transporting 70, 70 kilograms of flesh is not a very good way to move us around. Um, and so we are in such a tight position where we have to think through all of these 
um, opportunities. And there's a real emissions opportunity cost if we end up building more roads. That's not to say we shouldn't repair the ones that we have. Um, so we repair the ones that we have, no new roads, and any infrastructure should be looked at in terms of a long-term sort of sustainability and emissions profile that, in fact, this report embeds in it. So, um, yeah, no new roads.